I think it's a wonderful opportunity for folks to come into the city to see what the Avenue of Fashion is doing now. Hi there, my name is Taylor Claybrook. I'm an oral historian for the Detroit Historical Society. My job, I get to talk to people from across Metro Detroit to preserve their stories and experiences. Also, I can share that history with you. Our mission here at the Detroit Historical Society is to tell Detroit stories and why they matter. That is why over the past two years, we've been hard at work on The Hustle, Detroit's unsung entrepreneurs. The Hustle is a celebration of the rich tradition of black entrepreneurship here in Detroit. We're going to talk with community members, funders, and entrepreneurs about the city. We'll look back at the history of black entrepreneurship in Detroit and explore what is happening today. Where the west side ends and the northwest side begins may depend on who you ask, but there is no question that these neighborhoods are pure Detroit. On this episode, we'll explore Detroit's west side and Livernoy Avenue. I am extremely excited about the development of the Six Mile Corridor and the Livernois Corridor for pleasure and for business. It thrills me. I eat and shop in those districts. That's Sir Kwabana, the founder and CEO of LGBT Detroit, a local nonprofit that served Detroit's LGBT community for more than 20 years. We chatted with Zier about growing up shopping at local mom and pop shops, getting his start on the Avenue of Fashion, and his hopes for the West Side. Detroit's West Side is home to many famous neighborhoods, the Old West Side, Palmer Park, and the Aviation Subdivision, to name a few. But not all of Detroit's neighborhoods have a name. The neighborhood that I grew up in did not have an identifiable name. The neighborhood was partitioned with Finkel on the south, Hubble on the east, west was Greenfield, and north would have been Puritan Avenue. Over the years, many map makers, private developers, and city planners have named neighborhoods across Detroit to attract new residences and businesses to mix success. Is it the Cass Corridor or Midtown? Is it New Amsterdam or New Center? What about Core City or West Corktown? Not only are neighborhood names debated, but so too is the West Side itself. Unlike Detroit's East Side, the West Side is often divided into three distinct areas, the West Side, Northwest Detroit, and Southwest Detroit. Where each begin and end depends on who you ask. The West Side would make up areas around Northwestern High School. That would be West Grand Boulevard, Grand River, Dexter area. Northwest Side, I believe, would be anything above Finkel Avenue. And Finkel being Five Mile Road would start the Northwest journey. And again, anchored by Cooley High School, Mumford High School, and Redford High School. But what isn't up for debate is the potential that all of Detroit's West Side has to offer. Annexed by the city of Detroit from 1906 to 1926, this huge swath of the city was built as the auto industry and the Great Migration brought people to Detroit. Neighborhood shopping centers are vital to the health and growth of communities. For decades, big box stores and small local businesses line Livernoy Avenue, Grand River Avenue, Michigan Avenue, McNichols, and Seven Mile Road, anchoring these new neighborhoods. When I was younger and shopping at the Grand River Greenfield Corridor, Montgomery Ward was still there. Across the street was a store called Federal. Those were the two big department stores. What I liked about Montgomery Wards is that as a boy, they had a great record department. And so I remember buying 45s for Montgomery Wards. We primarily spent a lot of time in the department stores going up and down the escalators. But in the 1960s and 70s, the racial divide in Detroit deepened year after year. By the 1980s, over a million white residents had left Detroit. Since 1952, the exodus of whites from Detroit's neighborhoods to the suburbs widened the gap between communities, but created new opportunities as well. Empty storefronts created a space for new black businesses as black entrepreneurs moved to the neighborhoods with their families. These neighborhood-centric entrepreneurs and businesses were an essential part of the community fabric. Neighborhood corner stores not only provided resources, but also jobs as locals were often behind the counter. These entrepreneurs and business owners served as role models and mentors to young children in the neighborhood, too. Yes, the stores were operated by African-American black folks. Yes. Not only was it normal, it was very typical. I was surrounded in a school that was 95% black. The social groups in the neighborhoods were... Uh, 90 to 100 percent black, and and even if you weren't black, the other would have been white. And white being non-ethnic, not necessarily 
Italian or Polish or, or even Jewish. But I remember my aunt worked at a party store and the owner did not look like us. Their skin and their hair complexion was different. That was my first time seeing a different kind of person behind neighborhood mom and pop retail. The people around me were pretty much, you know, black and or looked like me. These small mom and pop corner shops and restaurants were neighborhood staples and brought food, services, essentials, and fun to residents. Next to Serving Middle School was the local candy store. The merchants would be there early enough to make sure that we'll be there to buy our candy, L- literally penny candy. So whatever change we were able to muster up, we would buy our candy before we got to class and after. Right next to that was a Coney Island where if you wanted a sandwich or something were meaningful, you could get that. Another favorite store were what we used to call party stores, was on Robeson and Finkel, which was the larger one in the area. But there was a smaller one, very smaller one, that sat right in the middle of a residential block on Hubble between Midland and Keeler. That was literally right around the corner where we would buy, you know, candy, drinks. My mother used to get me there to buy her pantyhose. And of course, we went to buy cigarettes for the adults because that's what adults did back then. And so it was nothing to just walk around the corner to that store. We knew the owners and they were friendly and we were kids. And some of us just went there just to say hello to them. But often we would buy sugar and salt and those things that children are addicted to. Detroit's economic downturn continued to worsen in the 1980s. Montgomery Wars on Grand River, Hudson's downtown store, and other department stores closed their doors. Neighborhood corner stores and mom and pop shops followed as increased competition from chain liquor stores priced many out of business. As local shops shuttered, Westside shoppers turned their attention to one of Detroit's most important business districts, the Avenue of Fashion. On Livernore between seven and eight mile roads, the Avenue of Fashion held on to its culture as many of Detroit's retail stores shuttered. My first major job was there. So when I see the spot, I just have pleasant memories. That was a wonderful opportunity that my former boss gave me as a boy. My first boss was an African-American, black, gay man who hired other African-American people who served African-American people. That business was called Backroom Designs. David Eric was a fashion designer, and he had shared space in this rental where one business had the front and he had the back. So he named it Back Room. But he created a space where clothes were made by hiring a tailor and a seamstress, and he would have lots of fabric and lots of goods to manipulate. And his clientele would come in the back and would wear custom goods. And his clients were local artists like Millie Scott and Othea Barnes. So I remember meeting divas when I was a kid and, and seeing all these highfalutin people. And I was, again, I was a teenage boy. I had like a little desk and he hired me to draw. I, I have a skill of illustration. And so he didn't. And so he would have an idea. My job was to draw it. And I did. And that's how he would sell to his clients his ideas. And I was so good that he took my work and he got entered and enrolled into a fashion and technology in New York City. I was so proud of myself because I helped this adult male, you know, pursue his um, design dreams. Over the last 30 years, the Avenue of Fashion has grown into an epicenter of diverse culture and Black entrepreneurship. Artists, designers, tailors, and other creatives flock to the Avenue to make their mark on Detroit's fashion scene. From Frederick Paul at Fahrenheit 313, to Algernon Bartell at Times Square Clothing, to Candace Williams at Barks Fifth Avenue. Building up and redeveloping Livernois Avenue and Detroit's other business districts is important for not only the city's economy, but for residents' quality of life. So I'm very happy and pleased to see the development in that corridor. I'm always anxious to see more. And there are other corridors that I see a glimmer of light, which I know at some point that will expand to. Besides doing community development, we're also telling the story, the legacy of that neighborhood, while we use that to build on uh, reimagining how this neighborhood could thrive once again. That's Neza Bendale, the small business resource manager for the Live Six Alliance. She's also a chef and the owner of Paradise Natural Foods, a catering company that specializes in healthy eating. We sat down and chatted with Neza to talk about how Live Six started and how she works to support businesses along McNichols on Detroit's west side. Well, that means that it is my job, but also my a personal mission to assist small businesses in that corridor. 
what I do is help the existing businesses, the ones that were able to stay, to get it, get whatever resources they need to thrive and a scale, and also to attract new business to a lot of the vacancies, vacant buildings that are in the corridor. Founded in 2015, the Lift 6 Alliance was built to support the revitalization of the McNichols Corridor and the neighborhoods along it, the Fitzgerald neighborhood, Bagley, the University District, and Martin Park. So Lift 6 Alliance originally came out of a project called Reimagining the Civic Commons. Detroit was one of five cities that was chosen for this initiative. Out of that initial initiative, it grew into Live 6. But in the, in the beginning, University of Detroit uh, was very involved. The um, former president of University of Detroit actually was personally responsible, I think, for helping to set the pace for what become Live 6. And so was Kim Tandy, who's the, the neighborhood manager for the city of Detroit. Since it was founded nearly a decade ago, Live 6 has partnered with the Mary Grove Conservancy, University of Detroit Mercy, the University of Michigan, and the Kresge Foundation to plan and fund revitalization projects to rebuild this once thriving corridor. There's a lot going on in terms of getting that neighborhood back to where it was like, say, 30, 40 years ago. Lift 6 tries to spread out our focus among the varied businesses that you find in, in the corridor that we serve primarily. I do reach out to other businesses like on Wyoming and Livernois, but technically we're bound by uh, Livernois to the east and then to the west Wyoming. Unfortunately, a lot of the businesses that thrived in the past in that corridor have been decimated, even before the pandemic. So it's sparsely settled by businesses right now. So mostly what you do have, though, and the, biz the new business I've started are food service business. So we do a lot of work with them. There's service businesses, but not a lot. So there's not a lot of business stock, but we're trying to grow that by strengthening the ones that are already there. So it'll make it attractive for people wanting to come in the area and set up. A major hurdle for many business owners is simply not knowing what resources are available. Engagement and education are at the forefront of Live Six's work. So it's a hybrid situation where they come to us and I approach them. I think when I took over the position, my approach is to hit the ground running. I walk the street, go in and out of businesses, talk to uh, business owners. And what I found is that a lot of the business owners were kind of siloed. They weren't really connecting with the business ecosystem, not just that stretch of Six Mile, but also in the larger Detroit ecosystem. So I was able to like tell them about initiatives going on that can help them. They had all these problems that they thought were unsolvable or even contemplating how much longer they could stay in business. And, and by going in the businesses and developing personal relationships with them, I was able to tell them, yeah, you're having an accounting problem, but there's a program for that. You need marketing, there's technical assistance available for that. Yeah, they'll come to us, the ones that are more forward, but a lot of people are just not aware that there's this large ecosystem with a lot of resources for them. So I found it really necessary for me to go and introduce myself, not just through an email or through a flyer, but personally going into businesses and talking to them and, you know, connecting on, on a personal level. Accessibility is essential for Live 6 to build sustainable relationships with businesses on the corridor. The easiest way to reach out to Live 6 is just come by. Uh, we have ambassadors at the office Tuesday through Friday. You can come in, they'll greet you. You can introduce yourself and what you're interested in. I encourage people to email and I get a ton of emails saying, hey, I'm a small business. I missed that last event you had where you convened a bunch of providers. Are you going to have another one? And I get them on my mailing list. This year I've started a uh, newsletter called All Up In Your Business. And that's just another way for us to continue to connect. Connecting local businesses and entrepreneurs with small business support organizations like Tech Town, Prosperous Detroit, and the Build Institute is key to the success of small-scale organizations like Live6. Besides being a um, connector to, uh, to technical assistance in the ecosystem, some things in the ecosystem that I see are missing. I'll convene and curate an event that will address that. So we do some of that, but we don't really have the bandwidth to be a technical provider as we grow and the need increases as more and more businesses come into the corridor, I can see us growing that part of the 
small business resource. So right now it's mostly connecting, but also for those other skill sets that's not being addressed in a meaningful way, I'll convene and put together workshops that, that business owners can tap into. My job is to figure out through my intake with the business what type of business they are and what their needs are, and then find the best fit to send them to get resources or curate the resources at our head office and invite them in to talk to all these different service providers that they can then get their particular business addressed that way. Live 6 connects with neighborhood residents to fully engage the community and push for the revitalization of the corridor. I still connect with the community because we have to find out from the community that's there, like, what kind of businesses do you want to see? What's lacking? What was here before that's no longer here that you'd like to see return? How can we help support your favorite business that's been able to stay? What would you like to see? So that's not just going to the business owners, but also the community. Since 2015, the city of Detroit has invested heavily in the corridor through the Strategic Neighborhood Fund, overhauling the streetscape and raising neighborhood pride. The corridor has grown. We've had streetscape completed so it looks totally different than it did three years ago because it's the you know we have the bike lanes and streets we have several new developments that have started some have been completed so yeah it you can see the progress and the neighbors are always like amazed and and saying you know five years ago this didn't look like this we didn't think this strip would ever come back and I've lived here for 30 years and I remember you know, in the 80s, 70s, 60s, what it used to look like when it was a thriving neighborhood. So we're on our, hopefully on our way back to that. And we are attracting developers and trying to curate what that looks like based on what the neighborhood says that they want. Live 6 hosts pop-up markets in the community to support local entrepreneurs and to encourage aspiring entrepreneurs to come to the corridor. Unlike other neighborhood development groups in the city, Live 6 lacks a neighborhood business incubator and pop-up space to assist entrepreneurs, but that is about to change. Right now we're working on a really exciting project. It's going to be called Shops and Six. We have some other real estate adjacent to our building that we're turning into a kind of a marketplace. So it's also going to be an incubator to bring businesses that might be at that stage where they need assistance and they want to get into a brick and mortar, but they're not quite ready. And in order for us to figure out what kind of businesses we should try to bring into the incubator, what shops and six should look like, we held for the last year, like several sessions of community engagement, we asked that very question, like, what would you like to see in your neighborhood? lived in this neighborhood. I wanted to open a business in the neighborhood and I wanted to bring a little piece of Puabic from the east side to the west side. So that is why I opened up Art in Motion. That's artist and ceramist Kay Willingham. For 10 years, she has been the founder and creative power behind Art in Motion, a ceramic studio and art gallery on Detroit's Avenue of Fashion. Kay grew up shopping on the Avenue of Fashion with her mother and watched as the strip weathered Detroit's ups and downs. Yes, I grew up being... Um, <laughs> very much uh, walking the streets of the Avenue of Fashion as a child with my mother and, uh, you know, just watching the transition through the decades. It was it was pretty major. We were one of the first black families to move on my street right after the riots in 68. It was considered a high-end area uh, of, of beautiful boutiques and, and, and stores. But some of the locations we used to visit was uh, Marty First, Bell Jacobs, Ferguson's, I definitely remember Hack Shoes, Grinnell's, the music place. They had the beautiful pianos in the window. I definitely remember that. Um, so, yeah, it was a wonderful, wonderful avenue of fashion. And even today, I mean, we have some new stores that are that have been there now for probably last, of course, 10 years since I've been there, but longer than I have. And uh, they are making their own name as well. The avenue of fashion was not immune to Detroit's economic downturn or the effects of white flight and disinvestment. From 1960 to 1980, many white-owned stores on the avenue relocated to the suburbs threatening the stability of the district. And there was what they call white flight. And most majority of whites moved to the suburbs and, um, you know, the malls open, Northland, Somerset, and a lot of the beautiful stores that were on the Avenue of Fashion, the boutiques, moved to those particular malls um, to expand as well. So the neighborhood, like I said, it changed, um, became primarily black, I would say probably 70, 30 percent. The exodus of white businesses created an opportunity for black entrepreneurs to cultivate the avenue of fashion as an epicenter of black creativity and excellence. 
The transformation didn't happen overnight, and it wasn't easy. But over the last 15 years, the avenue has attracted new investment from both the city and private funders, breathing fresh life into the strip. I remember when uh, when Mayor Duggan came in and he said there were going to be 14 neighborhoods I want to change and uplift. And the Avenue of Fashion was one of them. And, uh, they, you know, like I said, there was some opposition in the beginning because they're thinking, OK, who's this white guy coming into the hood and trying to change everything? Well, he has. And, you know, there's still a little bit of backlash, but. He's done a beautiful job in changing our neighborhood. I'm hoping and praying we don't go back to what happened 30 years ago where things you know, just kind of died down and we really became the hair capital, which wasn't a bad thing. But then you had all the blight that was still sitting around. But now you're seeing that blight move on, move away. And, and folks are stepping up and trying to make that area beautiful, make it shoppable, make it walkable. make It's a family area. To attract entrepreneurs to the avenue of fashion, the Detroit Economic Growth Corporation's Revolve program hosted entrepreneurs in a pop-up space in June of 2013. Pop-ups are an essential testing ground for entrepreneurs. Kay jumped at the opportunity with her then-business partner. I went to the meeting, and uh, a gentleman, Michael Forsyth, who was part of D Detroit Economic Growth Revolve program, gave us the proposal. It was what they were planning. They had a $250,000 art grant to revive the Livernoise Avenue corridor. And so went to the meeting. They proposed to have a pop-up. And since there were many, I guess in the retail world, we call blank doors, closed doors on the avenue, they wanted uh, businesses to open up there. And so um, they were just really trying to see the interest and, uh, of course, solicit those who would be a part of it. And they thought they would start out with having pop-ups. So they did a pop-up, and then after that, folks were able to pick up applications, submit their applications, basically business proposals, and there was a community vote. And so with the community vote, they were able to come out, of course, pick the business that they liked and why they wanted that business to be there. And so what we ultimately found out, once we found out that we were part of one of the businesses to open, was that we had the most votes out of... Mm, I think they said over 100 plus businesses. And the main reason was because people wanted something to do in the neighborhood. Transitioning from a pop-up to a brick and mortar is a crucial step for entrepreneurs. Support from partner organizations like Tech Town Detroit, Prosperous, and later Motor City Match made the difference. So um, we wrote our business proposal and um, we were able to afterwards sit down with several different entities for someone that did marketing, someone did actually helping us do our displays and logos and branding. And so they, they were very helpful in, in even furnishing the place because most of us as entrepreneurs, oh, we're coming in, we were new. And, you know, you think you have all that education and background, you know, that was just thrown out the window. DGC, Detroit Economic Growth, they had several resources for us to tap into. And Tech Town was one of them. And so I think depending on what your actual need was, they sent representative from there. And uh, we were able to basically get be interviewed by these, these folks and say, what are your needs? What do you want? How can we help you? How can we assist you? And so from there, they were able to send out even more people <laughs> to assist us, depending on what our resources that we needed help with. So, uh, so yeah, Tech Town was, was very helpful. Detroit needs a wide variety of businesses to support its residents. Entrepreneurs that offer entertainment and fun are just as important as restaurants, clothing stores, garden centers, and service providers. Following a split from her business partner during the months following the pop-up, Kay built Art in Motion into an avenue of fashion staple. Being a part of the avenue is a dream come true for Kay. It was a place to shop, a place to walk, a place for your family, for your friends, for a date, just even for yourself to take a general fun time up and down Levernois. And even now when folks come to see me, they're like, oh, there's so many new stores. There's so many places you can go to eat, to shop, to hang out with your friends. And I think that's the future for the Avenue of Fashion. I'm glad to be a part of that. I think it's a wonderful opportunity for folks to come into the city to see what the Avenue of Fashion is doing now, but also to appreciate and understand how the Avenue of Fashion started and its growth through through the decades and to see where it, it not, like I said, not just where it was, but where it's going. It's, it's wonderful to be known that now it's considered a place for black entrepreneurs to, to open and develop. I believe there's nine neighborhoods that surround the Avenue of Fashion. And it's good to see all of them growing and, and also supporting the entrepreneurs on the Avenue of Fashion. So I think it's a great place for anybody to open up a business, no matter what it is.
I'm Taylor Clearbrook. Thank you so much for joining us. This podcast is produced by the Detroit Historical Society and Bank of America. It is executive produced by Billy Wallwinkle. The Detroit Historical Society podcast team is Bill Pringle, Brendan Roney, Billy Wallwinkle, and myself, Taylor Claybrook. Our editor is Christian Hanks. A special thanks to Zir Kwabana, Neza Mendele, and Kay Willingham. A full bibliography will be available on our website for further reading. Now go and see what Detroit has to offer. Shop local, eat local. And now to play us out, Mr. E in the D.